question to the guests as well. Uh, if you could just kindly mention which guests you'd like the question to be targeted at, that'd be really helpful. Amazing. So without further ado, I'd love to introduce you to Dr. Richard Kirkham. He's actually from, he's, he's actually a lecturer from UCL as well as the University of Man, um, University of um, Manchester. Richard, are you, are you there? Hi. How you doing? Hi, Yasmin. How are you? I'm good, thank you. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. And thank you for the invitation to join you all today. It's a uh, it's, uh, real pleasure and, and a privilege, so thank you. Ah, absolutely. Um, can I just find out, are you at the university at the moment? Um, I'm at the Liverpool John Moores University, um, not Manchester. My students are taking part in a um, engineering day-long challenge today, so I've uh, dipped out of that um, momentarily <laughs> joined you today. So I uh, will be back very shortly to judge on their performance, and hopefully they'll win. <laughs> oh, oh, thank you so much for squeezing this in. It's, it's a pleasure, honestly. It's really nice to kind of get the academic lens as well as the practical. But I know that you do more than just, um, well, not just, but I know you do more than beyond your lectureship. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the work that you do as well? Um, and almost understand a bit how it connects with FM. Sure. Um, so um, I am amongst many jobs at the university, the deputy director of the Thomas Ashton Institute, which um, was established in 2016, um, primarily focused on the um, mission to create a safer working world and of course you'll know Yasmin that buildings are our facilitators in part of, uh, of safe working conditions so um, my kind of role in the early days was to try and bring a built environment perspective to the work of the of the institute. Um, it's quite unique in academia in the sense that it's an institute that is jointly run with the civil service um, so I have two bosses my academic boss which um, is based down in, in Harwell at the STFC labs and my other boss is the chief scientific advisor in the health and safety executive. Um, so um, I have two masters to serve, but uh, hopefully I keep them both happy. Um, I'm and, sure you do. <laughs> <laughs> and so a couple of things that we've been working on at the moment, which I think are probably maybe of interest to your, um, to, to your members, is around building safety um, and, yes. and also kind of national resilience and the role of the built environment in in creating resilience. So um, we've been doing lots of work in that space, particularly during COVID-19. Yes. Um, so we were one of the, the kind of organisations that was um, working closely with Patrick Vallance um, in, in so far as the COVID-19 core national studies are concerned. Uh, so we did quite a lot of work to try and help government understand the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on the in the construction sector because of course that was one industry that continued to work throughout the the, the lockdowns but of course we needed to be certain that people working in the industry um, were in conditions that were as safe as as possible so we did a lot of work around around transmission there so I'm um, happy to share the reports that yeah. we produced on that after today's session if it's of if it's of interest to you. Thank you. So the... Thank you so much, Richard. Hold on. I just want what I want to do is I want to get into it a little bit further and I'd like to find out a bit more about how you digitalize, um, especially in some of these uh, critical areas. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to introduce the other uh, panelists that we have today and then perhaps we can have a discussion about that to get uh, moving forward and we can have a bit of a QA. Um, so we also have, alongside Richard, we have Lee Cooper. Hopefully he's with us at the moment. Um, I noticed, Lee, are you there? I am, Yasmin, good afternoon. Good afternoon, good afternoon. Uh, so you're in Lincolnshire at the moment? I am, yeah, yeah. It's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to meet you. I don't think we've actually officially met, so it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, as far as, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and um, to, to myself and everyone else here? Uh, good, e good evening, everyone. Um, I suppose, in a way, I wear a number of hats. Um, I've been in FM for getting on for, I've said 15 years on my profile. It's probably closer to 20, but I don't want to admit to being that old. 
Um, <laughs> I'm currently the commercial director for um, HPS services. So I'm responsible for um, the m and &E element of um, HPS. So we are uh, a hard and soft services FM company. So we're, I suppose, at the full face as such of delivering the services um, and looking to utilise technology um, where we can to uh, create a more efficient and um, potentially a more cost-effective way of doing things for our customers. Um, I'm the chair of IGFM North, um, so um, we've got the committee uh, working alongside me to create various events um, across the, the north of England, which takes into um, Yorkshire, up to Tyneside and Newcastle, across to the Lake District and across to Liverpool and Manchester and just slightly dip into uh, North Wales, but uh, that's normally the uh, the Welsh region's uh, responsibility, but uh, we've got uh, full coverage across the North and I'm also the Secretary of the Business Risk and Continuity SIG for FM. Thank you so much. I, do you know, I feel like I have a feeling that one of your from your SIG, you do these really amazing um, um, events, which is quite huge. I think it's uh, known across IWFM. I've only ever been to the one in London, but is that something that you host annually? Yeah, we host the uh, charity Summer, summer Ball. Um, it's always top secret until the doors open is in terms of the theme. So uh, <laughs> next year's Summer Ball, just for a, a shameless plug, is the 4th of July. And tickets okay. will be going to sale very, very soon. I'm noting it down just in case I get an invitation. <laughs> um, can I um, just ask uh, David, if we could just have a look at the following slide, it'd be lovely to see if we could move into some of them, pull uh, them straw polls, and then discuss a little bit further um, with Lee and Richard, some of the digitalization. Oh, sorry. Okay. Sorry, Lee, I think this one's yours, but he has, you have covered a little bit. Yeah, that's just our, our committee members for uh, the North region, rather than the London region. Amazing. Sorry about that. So what I wanted to kind of just go into was our straw poll, uh, first straw poll for today, and then bring back our panelists, um, and discuss a little bit more about that digitalization specifically focused on the AI. So if in front of you, what you'll have is um, a question and you're simply able to just answer the results um, when you get a chance. So the question is ways that AI can interface with FN. And um, I guess there's a, there's, there is a range of realistic use cases on what AI is and what it can do as applied in buildings, um, so it would be interesting to see if we've got any results here. And for those that are on the recording, you'll be able to have a look at some of the um, answers as well. Okay. I'll leave that on for just 10 more seconds and then. Great. Right, so some of the results have come back and it looks like equipment predictive analysis and using complex assets is some of the areas. Um, and it definitely makes sense based on the fact that post COVID, but also looking at when Lee was discussing hard and soft FM as well. It seems like predictive um, ways of using AI is definitely a way, uh, an important component um, to why AI is important today. Um, I wanted to know if, um, we could go back to our panelists and just X out of the polls and have a little bit of a discussion about some of these digitalizations. So uh, Richard, I know you were discussing just before I rudely interrupted you about the um, uh, the safety network, building safety network that you were 
um, looking into. Is there any ways that digitalization has been um, implemented there that you would like to share? Yeah, thanks, Yasmin. So um, it's a really good question. Um, as a younger postdoc student many years ago, when I'd got more hair and uh, less children, I worked on a European Union project where we developed a essentially a logbook for buildings. And the idea was it would mirror almost the same principles uh, that we um, kind of see when we own a car. We have a record of its maintenance and its MOTs and everything like that. Um, so we thought it was really sensible to do something like that with buildings and that that could be a digital asset that could be passed along to different building occupiers and it would help them use their assets in an intelligent way. Um, mm -hmm. But often developers were not particularly interested in that. You know, they were more interested in the returns from developing, selling on, et cetera. So whole life costing issues were less less of a, less of a concern to them. Um, but thankfully, the Building Safety Act um, has kind of re-emphasized the importance of digitalization of uh, built asset data. Um, and the golden thread, which is a key component of the Building Safety Act, is designed to try and provide that framework of creating a fully digital asset um, that will exist throughout the life of the building. So that's really good because not only I think will it help us avoid the um, the unacceptable loss of life that occurred during the Grenfell Tower fire, but it will also get us to think in a more kind of in a systematic way about how we manage our assets using, using data and information. I think it's a real challenge though. Um, I think the idea of being able to bring together disparate data sets from different duty holders through the building safety system is incredibly challenging. And at the heart of the problem is the, the need to place residents at the centre of the building safety system. And that is the lesson that we need to learn from Grenfell, is that residents were ignored, um, their voices were not heard, and as a consequence, people died. So I we need to accept that that needs to change. And I think digitalization has a way of helping us to do that. And just for context, Richard, because obviously Grenfell happened in the UK and specifically London, but obviously we would have uh, worldly people on the call. And uh, would you like to just share um, gr what Grenfell was for those that didn't know? Yeah, sorry. So Grenfell Tower was um, a, a fire in a high rise uh, tower block in uh, the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. Um, it led to a significant loss of life and the subsequent inquiry um, initially by Dame Judith Hackett, which looked at building regulations and then the subsequent full inquiry um, is due to publish its final report very shortly. And there will be serious, a series of recommendations in there around building regulations reform, um, mm -hmm. building management, building safety. Um, so I think there will absolutely be some really important findings in there for the FM community. Um, now, originally within the Building Safety Act, there was a, a proposal to create a new duty holder role, which would be the Building Safety Manager, but that has subsequently been scrapped, and instead there will be plans to uh, empower the accountable person or the accountable organisation responsible for the building. Um, that will be the role of ensuring residents' safety, but of course that's often a facilities management role. So yeah. we're really keen within what we're doing in Manchester to support that community of people and ensuring that they are empowered with the right tools, the right data and information and the skills to be able to work with residents to keep them safe and to ensure that their voice is heard. Thank you so much, Richard. And I think you've left it at a really nice point as well, talking about um, how we could try and get this data in the right way. Um, um, Lee, if you don't mind, it, based on your experiences and some of your daily tasks, um, when it, looking just back at the pool, uh, 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 straw poll and looking at predictive analytics, and is there any kind of thoughts that you have um, or any ways that AI has been able to support you or ways that you could think about AI um, supporting you in the near future? I don't think AI has been truly taken on board by a large number of the FM companies in regards to um, prevention as, as, as such. Um, there's a large link into um, BMS systems to uh, predict, but likewise, um, it, it's all about data. Data is king. Um, 
and an analytics via CAFM systems where you can drill down on the data against specific assets can actually help you um, review um, and predict potential problems with a, a specific asset. Um, where you the use of sensory um, um, aspects now are starting to come to the fore um, using um, sensors to check heat, um, to check temperatures, uh, look at water ingress, um, to even um, taking on some of the more medial tests that some of the engineers may have to take on, such as tap temps and things like that, that you do want to be required to do as uh, part of the UK legislation on a monthly ba uh, weekly basis, sorry. Um, and then also using AI to check for Legionella in um, some of the water systems as well. So the, it's evolving. It's not where we need it to be yet, but I think it, yeah. it's starting to, to progress and move forwards. And it's allowing our engineers to do alternative duties where normally they would be doing things uh, which are a little bit more mundane so we can provide better value for our customers. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I think there was a few things that you said there that were uh, critical. And one of the things that you highlighted that we haven't really touched on was legislations. And I wonder uh, whether um, we could think about or if there's any ways of, or if, there, if you had any opinions about any of the implementation of AI internationally and whether it's going to be something that's um, more prominent in certain places or another. And Happy for uh, Richard or yourself, Ellie, um, to take take a, an opinion on this. Uh, perhaps Richard, you'll talk about Grenfell, so perhaps you'll have some ideas about other areas uh, for this question. Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so um, one of the um, kind of learnings from Grenfell is the need to um, improve trust in the state and its functions, because of course, many of the victims of, of Grenfell and their families feel let down by the, the poor building regulations, performance and the mechanisms that should have been in place to keep people safe. So trust is an issue. Um, I think trust is an issue with AI too. And I think that's something that's come out of the AI safety summit that was held at, at Bletchley Park recently. Um, so I'm working with some civil servants in HM Revenue and Customs who've been developing some expertise in this area. Um, and I am aware of a really interesting uh, community of academics and uh, industry experts and, and government officials who have come together to form a new community around AI assurance and, and, and AI governance. So yes, I think there is still work to be done in terms of implementing the technologies that underpin AI, in particular the mathematical aspects of it. But running alongside that must be work to ensure that the the public, the citizens, have trust in the use of these systems. Um, so in the context of digitalization and building safety, that is really, really important. People need to be able to be confident that the use of these tools and techniques uh, is leading to safe outcomes. Um, and that's um, an evolving area which um, I'm keeping a very close eye on. And hopefully within Ashton Institute, we'll be able to do some more work in that area. Um, and again, after today, happy to share some information about events that you might be interested in attending where we'll be discussing the the kind of the governance and ethical issues associated with the use of AI in the context of public services. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's a really good point. And obviously, from an international lens, um, AI does uh, will have to be um, in, uh, is impacted by the elements of trust. Um, no matter where you go, so it's a it's a good place to to think about um, and start off with with AI. Do we have any questions from the audience? That I'm just going to have a look if we have anything at the moment. And if not, it will be helpful to move on and see and speak with our second set of panelists, if that's okay. If there are any questions, please feel free to um, put them in the Q&A and um, just list the individual that you'd like to speak with. Um, we have two questions. I'm not able to currently see them, I'm so sorry. Someone's able to, sorry. Oh, here we go. 
Right, so we've got a question. Um, AI in the built environment is at risk of being a sales offer by those not special uh, specialists in the field. Um, and then AI in the other sectors arguably is the most advanced defense slash life science with a better value on data and its, and its management. Does the built environment understand what AI actually is rather or is the discourse more being mistaken for topics concerning good data management? Great question. Um, did you have, um, I'm not sure, there was no one that was listed here, but Lee, did you um, did you want to take this one in terms of looking at AI and trying to understand um, whether it's actually being mistaken or whether actually the built environment understands what AI is? The, the question from Keith is, is a good one. Um, yeah. I can understand in terms of the sales offer being made by those not specialists in the field. I would tend to agree with that. And mm -hmm. it's down to FMs to actually manage what is being offered and what where we can potentially use um, AI in the built environment. Um, Defence and life sciences are so far ahead of the built environment in terms of AI. Um, but when you look at the budgets that's, that's being spent in defence and life sciences, it should be. Um, and from my point of view, um, we've got a long way to go before AI is fully um, enveloped into uh, the built environment, and we tend to use it a lot more. Um, I think the closest we're getting is probably more around building building management and CAFM systems at the moment, but there's a lot of work to get us to where we need to be. And I think that's an interesting point as well. And perhaps academia could probably do a bit in terms of the research element, which is some food for thought um, following off the back of what Lee was mentioning. We have a, another question. Who is providing a coherent AI offering in the built environment? Um, so any ideas on this? Any any pillars that uh, would like to share? Um, I can probably give some insight. Um, Please, yes. The answer is probably nobody really. Um, so I I recall as a PhD student back in 1999, my first ever paper was artificial intelligence. Strangely enough, I've developed some very basic artificial neural networks to predict the costs of running sports centres in Liverpool and that the idea was to help the city council kind of manage its budgets. So we tried a few different techniques and they were reasonably good at, at in terms of their forecasting accuracy uh, but they were relatively small data sets so generalising from those was a little bit kind of dodgy if you might use that phrase. Um, I think that uh, the built environment and the wider construction industry has always suffered from significant disinvestment from research uh, whereas life sciences and, and other, perhaps may describe them as sexy areas of academic research, have always attracted lots of extra funding. And I think that's a, a tragedy. Um, Big buildings are the enablers of, of society in, in many ways. So I hope that, that there will be more investment in this area. But I think at the moment, speaking from a UK context, uh, there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done to actually get the construction industry back into a place where it's able to contribute to our economic growth. Um, and I think that's where ministers' minds are at the moment, is not within how do we apply AI to the construction sector. It's probably how do we apply new policy that can help the construction sector become more efficient and more productive um, and create sustainable employment um, across the, the regions of, of, of the UK. Um, so I hope that helps yeah. answer that question to some Plenty. extent. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to, before we move on, I want to say um, thank you so much to yourself, Richard. Thank you so much, Lee, for contributing to this um, introductory discussion. And I think there's a lot of food for thought here um, about AI and recognizing that we've got a long way to go, but there's, um, um, I guess, um, different angles we could look at AI before we start implementing. Um, just moving on to our third session of today, we are, we do want to introduce to yourselves the different networks um, and SIGs in IWFM. So, and just try to understand some of the different perspectives of how AI could, and digitalization as a topic could be seen um, within these respective communities. So, 
if I could kindly introduce to you um, our first join in. Yes, Jamie. Uh, Jamie is one of the um, uh, chair of one of the special interest groups at the on customer experience. And I'd love for Jamie to tell us a little bit about himself rather than myself uh, reading off a screen. Hi, Jamie. Can you hear me? I can, yes, and thanks for that. So, so I'm Jamie. Um, I've got the honour to be the chair of the IWFM uh, Special Interest Group for Customer Experience. Um, my day job is Customer Experience Director for Vivo Defence. We're the largest provider of um, FM and workplace services to the defence sector in the UK. Um, and the next slide you'll see later on will, will give some background in terms of our backstory. But my passion is to put the customer at the heart of the workplace and FM industry. And I think we've got some really great examples in the UK and Amina um, globally, but we're very inconsistent. And I think AI and data can really supercharge us um, and get much better at that. Thank you so much. I, I think that's a really key point that I'd love to get into a little bit more later about the inconsistencies. Um, Alistair, um, hi Alistair, are you there? Hi there, yes, I am here. Hi, hi it's a pleasure to meet you. Um, oh, so. Uh, hi, I can see you. Hello. So yes, um, Alistair is also an, um, the chair, and I believe the vet, is it, um, is it a new um, SIG? Yeah, yeah, it's okay. absolutely a new Bye. one. So it's not a SIG, it's a professional networking group. So uh, for those of you who recall, a couple of months ago, we had our AGM where we voted on uh, a new way of dealing with our special interest groups and our networks going forward. Uh, and the veterans group is something that's been been around in the making for the last year. I know there's been other attempts at it before. Uh, we managed to get this one across the line with, with a core group of, uh, of which are now make up the majority of the committee. Um, so we've been going, we've had our first meeting six weeks ago um, and then it's kind of a watch this space and, and see, how, see how we do. And, and the core reason behind that is if you look across your industry, um, our industry, um, there's a lot of veterans in it. Um, and actually, there's also a great swathe of service leavers uh, when they leave the military. So if you put those two together and put a, a nice collaboration across all the companies, and our, our committee demonstrates that, some of the big companies we've got in the team, uh, we can actually get a, a, a really clear route as a service leaver to come into this industry and add value. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Um, Alisa, um, we're obviously going to speak about it just in a moment. Um, can I just um, hand over to Jamie and Jamie would, uh, if you could kindly tell us a little bit more about the SIG and um, then Alistair uh, would love to hear about um, yours as well. Yeah, of course. You can see on the screen there our mission and the key milestones in our four year history. I won't read it out, you can read it, but I'll give some context. So we came together almost four years ago, gosh, where does the time go, to tackle an injustice we felt, and that's, that's quite a big word. If you ask people to reflect on some great experiences they've had themselves as a customer, they will talk in the UK about uh, John Lewis and Waitrose and Amazon, globally around Disney and Marriott and Qatar Airlines. Um, and that's all true. People almost never talk about the experience they had in their workplace. And that's wrong because across the UK, across me and across the world, every day there are tens of millions of really great customer experience delivery points um, where people who are motivated, driven, are uh, giving a great experience to the users of the estate. Um, but it's invisible. We don't talk about it. Um, and somehow the work that's done in catering, cleaning, security, hard FM maintenance, ground maintenance, um, engineering, it, it doesn't register as a great experience. And that's wrong. Um, so one of our key aims is to make sure we really celebrate uh, and get the recognition our industry deserves in terms of um, our performance. The second point, again, is consistency, because there are some amazing elements and examples of great experience being delivered, but also the opposite is true. So our aim is to share best practice, innovation, uh, and to really push the envelope of the members of the Institute, and at the same time, remind the people out there that the experience they're getting um, in their workplace, in the estates they work and live in, it's really good as well. So that there are two mantras. Second slide now shows the makeup of our of our group. Um, so um, we have a small committee. Um, it's quality, not quantity. But you can see on the right, we've got this model. So at the heart are five our volunteers in the committee. 
We've got 28 active members of our SIG and a wider LinkedIn group of a community of 140 people. And our focus for next year is to understand what that broader group want from us to add more value in terms of the proposition to come into um, into the into more active membership. So there's a lot of interest in what we do. When we have some of our face-to-face -face events, we can have almost 80 people turning up. Um, I've learned that, that managing and leading a group of volunteers is quite an interesting task. Um, and it's quite brutal as well. If people are getting value from the meetings, they'll keep coming. If they don't, they stop. So it's quite a um, quite a clear way to understand what our members want. And you can see there some steps coming up. Um, at the end of this month, we've got a, quite a key review session to understand the results of our membership survey. So every November, we ask our members, are we doing the right stuff for you? And that survey will give us some really key insight. If people on this call want to come along um, or to understand what more of what we do, then please drop me a line, really keen to grow and develop our SIG. Thank you so much, Jamie. Alistair, over to you. <clears throat> Absolutely. So I kind of dived into it first earlier, but uh, but the intent is is to harness this opportunity that we have now. Uh, there's a lot of veterans out there in our industry and there's a lot of service leaders. So it's about attracting. How do we make this a clear transition route into our industry? Uh, I definitely fell into FM. It's a common phrase you hear here around the industry. Uh, so actually, how do we make it a, a a career of choice rather than rather than falling into it? Support. We've got a lot of veterans and and reservists already uh, in the industry. How do we support them? How do we grow that community as well? And how do we retain? And that's around the events, the networking, and also that cross collaboration between between the companies that we've got involved so far. And and as that grows as well. We end up with a common platform of how we work and transition uh, veterans into our industry that that can only be uh, for the greater good so i've covered most of that already but uh, yeah it's about having that transition route professional membership and training it's also a big win for the IWFM as well on our, on our growth or journey uh, towards that chartership the more individual members we can get in and, and basically that's why they've fully gone behind this one we can bring people in but secondly we have a ground swell of individuals that we can we can get to join the institution uh, and then it's about the support and the uh, and and then that active community as well. Is that okay? Oh, committee members. Well, we've got quite a few. Uh, so uh, and and it was it was a hard run thing actually when when we when we went through this. But uh, just running from top to bottom, really short and sharp. Louisa Clark's been the driving force behind this. Uh, ex Churchill. And we've got Adam Phillips, he's Perito, Charlie and Mark, so that's Lawn Stewart and then Mighty. Um, and then we've got Churchill again. We've got, who's Andy, ISS. So as you can see from that long list, you probably know quite a few people in there. We've got a lot of uh, big players there and a lot of support as well from their businesses as we go forward. Thank you so much. Uh, we will we will um, have a conversation with you both, and I think it's really interesting. Two different areas that require a bit of a focus on AI, I, I would assume. Um, but before we go into it, we will have another straw poll just to get everyone involved. Um, so as you can see, we'll pop up on your screen. If you could um, just put in your uh, results, that'll be amazing. This one is about deploying AI into FM. So any problems that potentially you've encountered at, uh, in the current present and um, the increased use of AI in FM means some problems are reduced and various benefits also gained. So uh, what are your top five? We could just leave this on for a moment or two. just to show just to um, read out some of them are increased forecast and accuracy net cost savings faster planning and response times longer lasting asset lives uh, we've got oh we've got some comments on improved data analytics effectiveness which is interesting and raise career prospects for data capable resources and i think that's a really important one um especially when we are trying to bring in the academic world as well. And looking at Gen Z as well, that's an interesting space. So just leave that up for 10 more seconds. Okay. 
mechanism. So perhaps we can come into a conversation and before I go into this, um, if you do have any Q&A questions, please make sure just to reach out. And also we do have our previous uh, panelists as well on the call as well, in case um, something else comes up. But um, it'll be lovely to talk to you both about, I guess, your involvements with digitalization and how effective that is um, in terms of your networks and SIGs and how much of a conversation it steers up um, in these um, uh, more internal discussions. So um, perhaps Alistair, I could just go straight into you and because you are new as a network, what are your envisions for discussing or um, your thoughts around digitalization? So as, as a committee, to be honest, it's been hard enough work getting us off the start line, let alone diving into the core subjects such as that, but um, that it is something that's out there with a, with a lot of businesses. Um, and it is something that our, one of our whole mantras is, like we're doing today, is to, fund, is, is to, is to piggyback on a lot of the individual SIGs, uh, whether they're events, whether they're uh, forums such as this. So, so definitely going forward, uh, it will be something that will be discussed. I, I can say from my own personal side, from, from IEM's point of view, um, it's it's something we need to enhance our prog productivity. It's, it, we've got a lot of digitalization in there already from how we operate. Um, I think the risk is it's that over, over promotion of data and actually how do you turn that into a story that then you can sell to the client or tell this client what's happening. Uh, so, so it's something we're heavily looking at and investing in. Uh, where that takes us, um, we don't just want loads of data sitting there like we've seen in the past years. We want to be able to use that and then actually action something with a sim simple outcome. It is our mantra, if that helps. Yeah, no, perfect. It's just almost bringing that awareness out there and seeing yep. um, um, some lessons learned from it. Uh, Jamie, uh, just for the same question, really, we'll be really interested, especially from the customer experience point of view, because it's sometimes, I guess, from a customer experience perspective, we don't want to quantify things. Um, and I, I, it will be interesting to see how you um, approach um, digitalization, specifically AI technology um, in your um, discussions. It's a very interesting area. Um, I think there are some really good examples in our industry where there's some very digitally driven and some probably AI enabled customer journeys, but it's the exception. Um, the people that use our estates outside of their workplace are used to using their smartphone for their Domino's pizza, booking an Uber, buying on Amazon. It's a very, very rich environment. Generally, you come to work and the, the FM model is a bit 1980s. Generally, you can call an FM help desk and speak to a person. Generally, um, you can send them an email. Generally, there'll be a survey around satisfaction by email as well. And we sort of accept it. Um, no, that's not um, the whole picture. There are some really great um, examples based around personalization, empowerment, using your phone as a pass, all the things we've heard about that have their roots in BIM and digital twins. But for at least half of the industry, nothing's changed in 30 years. And we sort of accept it. Um, and it's strange that the, our customers and state users, they sort of go, yeah, well, at work, it's different. There's a huge opportunity to make the experience richer, to take out mm. cost, to make it more bespoke by using um, technology. In terms of AI, um, I think there are three main areas. First one's around design. I think customers don't always know what they want. They can be prompted and helped. Um, but using AI to design workplaces that are more ergonomic, more frictionless, more efficient, more fun as well, um, I think it's a huge opportunity, especially in terms of getting people back into the workplace. If the workplace has barriers, isn't engaging, why would you go there? I think AI can provide a, a, almost a critical friend data set to say, well, let's design it this way. Second piece around enabling the journey, that's where calling a help desk is just antiquated. Um, uh, chatbots and AI technology means all the things that somebody in help says to somebody who calls through can be done more efficiently, more effectively, more consistently. And you get the people for the escalations and the problems. But at the moment, as an industry, we pay a lot of money to people who are really clever just to ask questions about which floor the issue is on. And we could use their brains and their intelligence, and their passion much more um, fluidly. And the third thing is around monitoring and measurement. There are some great examples of condition-based monitoring, harmonics to um, listen to the sound that a lift motor makes. But again, they're the exception. 
I think we are, we are dabbling in it. And there's a huge opportunity to give our customers a better experience, our teams more enjoyment as well, because a lot of things that they're doing manually that can be automated are quite boring, but really um, leap ahead. Because if we can be as good as Uber or as good as Domino's are in three years' time, that would be transformative. As an industry, we've, we've, we've talked a good talk around technology and AI. Um, there's some great examples. I'm not just in the industry, but but consistently, it's not what FM does at the moment. And there's, there's a huge opportunity there. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I'm going to just jump, um, dive in, not jump, dive into the questions. There is a question that has popped up and it'll be nice to just squeeze this one in as well. Um, so if you just have a look on the Q&A, but I'll just read out loud. AI in the built environment is at risk of being a sales offer by those not specialized in the field. AI in the other sectors arguably is more advanced uh, uh, defenses, life sciences, the better value on the um, uh, data management. Um, so sorry, sorry, I think this is one of the previous questions, but I guess one of the things that, let's have a look. Well, just, just coming in there. So um, there's a really yeah. brainy guy who works for um, Ekran's called Simon Ball. And he said to me five years ago, the future FM companies will be Amazon and Tesla because mm -hmm. you can come and disrupt. Um, and Tesla decide, decided to start making cars. Amazon went from selling books to everything. So the risk is we're very internally focused and the same in-house teams or the same outsourcers just think they can do it forever. Somebody who understands data could come in as Tesla did with cars and just transform it entirely. So I think there's so much value in that data piece. The risk, though, is that somebody who knows nothing about the nuance of the industry and compliance and legislation and risk management and dull things like asbestos registers comes in and says, yes, we're great at this. We've got some great data tools. And as the question has picked yeah. up, there's huge risk in that. So we need a balance of, I guess, competence and compliance, but supercharged with the ability to to make to take the next step. But I think. I think it could be that the, the biggest FM outsource company in MENA in five years' time doesn't exist at the moment. And not through consolidation, yeah. because there can be a new market entrant who just gets it with a different approach and isn't hidebound by the way things have been done since 1980. And it's an interesting point, and thank you so much for just dumping in there. I, I think it, it does raise us to a question here, is how much can we really learn from the other sectors and how much... Um, and what are the differences when we're as an FM industry and what are the things that we have to accept uh, are our risks and um, how do we then ensure that um, we're not just copying or trying to um, learn too much from the other sectors. And I think it would be nice to then at this point think about um, some golden piece of advice um, uh, that we could um learn more about uh, digitalization in our areas and um, particularly from your different areas of interest at the moment so if we could um think about some some advice um in terms of um how we're going to learn uh, with digitalization specific specifically ai it will be really amazing to hear from both of you um alistair if it's okay i'd like to turn over to the question to you yeah i think I think as I alluded to before, uh, and I, I've come across centre technology, we did a lot at, at BA and the airports, for example, where we could tell you when an escalator motor was going to go it, months before it actually did. We used to have it on helicopters in the military as well. We could tell when there's going to be a failure. We did it in the military because we were tuned to do that and it was a central piece of kit. When it came to the airports, for example, I could tell you know, my seniors as much as I wanted that it was going to fail and it was going to cost X it didn't matter. So, so it's about having that, stop hiding behind the complexity and that's the risk. We, we have all this stuff thrown up in the air, all this data sets, all this uh, language that we hide behind. If we, we've got to tell that simple story, that customer experience type it, to the senior decision makers. Uh, so actually we can implement the information uh, or the resultant that we're, that we're finding through the information. Um, and, and that's my biggest takeaway um, on this. We, we can come up with this great stuff. It won't land unless we make it simple to understand and are able to action it. Great point. Thank you so much. I, I do just want to apologize for the questions that we haven't been able to answer. Um, I'm very sorry about that. We will respond on LinkedIn um, um, just after this um, call as well. Um, let's see. 
I think we're conscious of time at the moment. Um, so just looking at, um, I will gladly um, say thank you so much to both of you for having this discussion. While it was short, but it was really nice to A, meet you, welcome you to uh, the IWFM from a committee point of view, um, Alison, and as well, as well as I'm really excited to hear about the more about customer experience. So I think it's a really nice and interesting area when it comes to digitalization as well. So looking forward to that. Um, I will be handing over at this point to uh, David, uh, who we heard from at the beginning. And um, yes, so thank you so much for listening to us. And over to you, David. Lovely. Thanks very much, Yasmin. Um, we've just got a, one question, I think, left over from uh, Mr. Keith Sweeney, who's been very helpful in uh, providing some of these. Uh, we'll come on to your final question out of the three shortly, uh, Keith. And what we're going to do is just to run through also for our benefit, uh, is uh, straw poll number three, which is essentially, there's a whole wide series of choices. I mean, you're starting off with a bold, ambitious campaign, such as this, committing to a monthly rollout. Uh, the aim, as we put there, was to try to introduce and involve a university campus, be it virtually or actually. Um, there's uh, one series of questions for the uh, TSR topics, uh, and it's your choice for those that are uh, online now. And what I'd like to ask is on the basis of if there's a particular topic you'd like to see coming up next, uh, while plan for December is to focus on SLAM and drones, uh, for those that, that uh, want to have a drone on their Santa wish list, uh, that's what we'll be looking for. Uh, the plan is to uh, be running it as a hybrid event from University of Birmingham and look out in the next week for the uh, information on that as it's coming up. So if there's anybody who's uh, on that basis, for those that would like to participate, uh, watch the topics they'd like to see next. If you want to confirm it, then that will run and uh, adapting the, uh, the process as we go. Uh, the other topics that you select help us to choose what is popular by the attendees, as well as being able to run these on separate uh, events. So if anybody else wants to continue to vote out of those who are online, uh, just let us know which of the topics appeal to you. Uh, the aim at the outset is to encourage individuals to focus on many aspects of AI, not just on the digital twins. And by linking today, grateful particularly to the likes of uh, uh, Dr. Richard uh, Kirkham for his insight. We'll follow him from the golden thread as with the last one. So there's a theme of technology. I think we can wrap up that one now, please. Uh, for Hazel and Anna running in the background now. Um, let's have a look at the results. If we share those results now for uh, the particular topics that have come up. And we'll see, I think that basically it's running at about a third for Slam and Drones, also for the technology platforms and focusing all on BIM, Kobe, uh, IFC and DUT, which is good. So thanks for that. We can stop sharing on that one. And we'll move on now just to a couple of other points of uh, uh, housekeeping and the like. Uh, the, the events coming up, uh, the nearest one, which is in the calendar for the rest of the people, is from our colleagues uh, who are in the London region. They've got an event on the 15th of November, which is in a similar vein, as we support them by their use of artificial intelligence, not as uh, it was repeated, I think it was by Paul McCartney, if I'm not wrong, was who referred to it as artificial insemination rather than artificial intelligence. A bit of a, a tongue twister there. Uh, but in terms of the various different events coming up, that's the next one on the 15th of November in London. And for those who went 21st of November in London, there's the next one, and there's others for the veterans uh, coming from the organisation that Alistair represents. And those are three or more details of this as for the link. If you want to do a screen capture, you'll see the link at the bottom on the IWFM website. And as we scroll through to the next one, uh, we've got virtual training opportunities, which are coming up in November for environments and for uh, pathways. So for those who want to choose on those, the 8th of November, about halfway through the course for the first one, but... Uh, if nothing else, the topics are repeated on a regular basis. And again, you can go to the various different uh, aspects and uh, page selves. And this particular uh, group goes, 
Uh, we've got this roadshow, as I said, it's the second Wednesday of every month for those for the diaries. And the next one will be coming up in uh, December. So on that basis, it's the same time, same slot, four o'clock on the second Wednesday, Birmingham base, but on the 12th of December. And then for those who are keeping a record of it, for this particular event, there is a, a CPD number, Continuous Professional Development, 15097, a lottery, I regret, but that's for those who are interested in those. And in particular, our thanks to the hosts and to the guests, sponsors and supporters of this event. So we've got for the first pair coming on for University of Manchester and for Dr. Rich's time and for Lee Cooper and the Northern Region and then for Jamie McDonald. So thanks to each of those for the time and the preparation. And uh, for you, for those who have attended, for joining this particular event, thank you to our guests. And to it, those in the background, uh, I won't list them all by name, but uh, in particular to uh, Hazel Bedson and to Anna Roberts for helping and support producing and uh, rolling through on the programme as we've gone. And the there is a recording which will go out on YouTube in due course. Otherwise, that's just us coming up towards the air. Thank you very much 